Greetings, Mavuno family, and happy new month. <laughs> my name is Muredi Wanjao, and I am the senior pastor of Mavuno Church. It's my joy to welcome you into this time of worship, and I'm so honored to be bringing God's word to you as we begin this new month. I want to just offer a very special welcome to our first time visitors. Uh, whether you're watching live today, watching this recording later online, we're so, so glad that you're part of our family today. You're so welcome here. And we'd love to pray for you this week. So hey, uh, kindly take a screenshot of the link on your screen right now. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from, how we can pray for you because we are delighted that God allowed you to be part of our family today. Also, let us know if you'd like to be part of our online church by being part of one of our online community groups, one of our discipleship groups. Uh, for those of you who are regular members, of Mavuno. We are so glad you're part of this family as well. And if you're not already in a discipleship group, uh, we'd love to connect you with one. So please uh, use the same link and let us know how we can, uh, where you are and how we can connect you. And then also allow me to pray for us now as we start, uh, as we get into God's word uh, and as we give our tithes and our offerings. Father, I want to thank you so much for the beginning of a new month, new things, new blessings. And Lord, even as we come before you to, to give our gifts, uh, our tithes and our offerings, bless them, Lord, as we give. But Lord, in addition to that, I pray that you'd open our hearts wide, open our, our ears, that Lord would hear exactly what you have for every one of us. And I pray that this month would be a, a life-changing month. As you bring your word to bear upon our lives, help us begin to understand things about you and about ourselves and about the people you want us to be. And I pray that, Lord, none of us would ever be the same. And so, Lord, we bless you, we honor you, and we thank you that you're with us. And we look forward to just learning together with you, hearing from you. For we pray in Jesus' name and God's people say, it. Amen. Amen. Now, this month, we're starting a brand new series called Call of Duty, Standing Firm against your enemy. That explains, by the way, why I'm dressed like this. I don't always dress like this for our visitors. Uh, we want to dig into some of what the scriptures teach us about the battle that we face as Christians. You know, there's a gifted author called C.S. Lewis who wrote a book that was called The Screw Tape Letters. It's a, it's a very interesting book to read. It's a fictional collection of letters from a senior demon to a junior demon. So already you can just tell from the premise that you would enjoy reading that book. And basically what the senior demon is doing is teaching the junior demon how to effectively destroy the life of the human being assigned to him. And so it's basically this, uh, uh, it's like this guy was trying to distill what he knows about how the devil works in human beings' lives. And it's a very insightful book. And one of the quotes that C.S. Lewis wrote in this book, and I think it's true, Today, as it was back in his days, he wrote, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils, about demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Now, I'm sure you've witnessed this yourself. I mean, there's some people who would be so skeptical if they ever heard you speaking about spiritual warfare, about encountering something demonic. They would think you're getting spooky or superstitious. They'd be like something, has, I mean, like how can an, educa an educated person like you think like this? They, for them, the devil is nothing more than the figment of fertile religious imaginations. And spiritual warfare, they see it as a cop-out for people who refuse to take responsibility for their lives and instead have chosen to blame some unseen spiritual reality. I mean, there are people who are like that. But, but allow me to say this right from the onset, that this is not a biblical position. When you read the scripture, it's full of stories that clearly show us that there is a devil and there are demons, and this is a reality. Jesus himself addressed this and had conversations that show us clearly that he believed this, refusing to acknowledge their existence, the existence of, of, of personal evil of the devil is the same as a person who refuses to acknowledge the existence of gravity. Let me tell you, my friend, it will still affect you whether you believe in it or not. Uh, on the other extreme, however, are those people who, and maybe you've run into some of them, people who see a demon behind every bush. I don't know if you know people like those. Their solution to every problem in the world is just bind it in the name of Jesus. You don't have rent, bind the spirit of rentlessness or poverty or whatever it is. You're struggling with anger and anger issues, bind the spirit of anger. Are you struggling in your marriage? Bind the spirit of, of marriage breakup. You're eating too many chapatis, break. Break and bind the spirit of chapatis. I don't know what it is, the spirit of calories. Now, of course, I'm being a bit uh, exaggerated here, but you know, the thing about it is, this too is not a biblical position because it gives too much credit to the devil. 
The Bible teaches us that once we accept Christ, we now have the responsibility to say no to sin and to stand against the devil, to do the right thing. And so it's not everything that is about the devil. There's some things that we have to take responsibility for as well. Now, fortunately for us, the Bible has a, a path for us that is in between these two equal and opposite errors. And it's not quiet about how we should understand with and deal with this topic of spiritual warfare. And that's what we're going to be looking at this entire month. Today, I'd like us to turn our attention to an important part of Scripture, the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 10 to 12. The title of my message is Know Your Enemy. Know your enemy. And as you turn there, it's important for me to just say a few things about the book of Ephesians. It's a, it, it's a letter that was written by the, probably by the Apostle Paul, and he, probably from prison, and he sent it to Christians in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a city uh, in what today would be modern-day Turkey. And in Acts chapter 19, we learn that Paul had spent three years in fruitful ministry in this city of Ephesus. He preached boldly about Jesus. He led daily discussions. He performed extraordinary miracles for all those years. And then years later, he wrote this very encouraging letter to the church of Ephesus to help them understand who they were in Christ. And towards the end of his letter, he wrote about something that he doesn't dwell in very much in his other letters. And it's in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10. So let me read it for us as we begin. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Father, I pray that you'd open our eyes, that we would understand this word because this word is important and critical for every believer. The Bible doesn't say much about the devil, but we do know that he was created by God as one of his angels, that he led a rebellion against God, and that he was expelled from heaven as a result. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, just note those down. Those are the two parts of scripture that actually talk it, uh, about this. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. They give us a very brief, uh, brief glimpses of his history. We know that he was there in the Garden of Eden at the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, and he came in the form of a serpent, that he successfully tempted Adam and Eve to join his rebellion against God, that he led them to lose their privileged position as God's managers in charge of the earth. And as a result, the enemy took over the authority that humans were meant to have. First John chapter 5 verse 19 says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. I mean, this is what happened. He took over control of the world. And the rest of the Bible is a story of God's salvation, culminating with Jesus, God coming down to earth in human form to end humanity's rebellion and to restore rulership and authority back to human beings. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, uh, the Apostle John wrote, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And it says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Christ came to destroy the devil's work. So whenever it is, uh, whenever it comes to spiritual warfare, we must understand <laughs> that we are fighting from victory. Christ has already won the victory. The victory has been won. We're not fighting for, for victory. We're fighting from victory. And we're fighting for what is already ours. Somebody say amen. I think we, we need to come at this knowing that the victory has been won, but we have to enforce this victory. And Paul begins with this very strong exhortation. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, if you passed two people, imagine you passed some people and they're having a conversation and one was saying to the other one, by the way, be strong. Just be strong. Man, you really have to be strong. What would you imagine they were talking about? I mean, immediately you would understand that somebody was facing problems. <laughs> There's no way somebody would be telling you be strong if everything was all right. Yeah. I mean, Paul is basically reminding the Christians that they are in a state of war. You have to be strong because you're in a state of war. Because they are chosen to follow God, now God's enemy had become their enemy. Now, that's a very important thing for us as Christians to understand. Extremely important. Did you know that when it comes to the spiritual realm, you are in a war zone? You're actually in a war zone. 
The minute you accepted Christ, a big target appeared on your back. Many Christians don't know this, but it's the truth. Not because you're so special, but because of who you represent. The enemy of the one you represent became your enemy. You see, before you receive Christ, you are no threat to the enemy uh, because you are part of his kingdom. <laughs> but now you are a threat and you should expect his attacks. Someone once said, if you haven't met the devil recently, maybe it's because you are walking in the same direction. You know, uh, and so, so you should expect some problems. You should expect some attacks. You should expect some challenges. And that is so important for Christians to understand because modern day Christians, we sometimes seem to have a magical view of our faith. Like if I give my life to Jesus, then I shouldn't have any problems going forward, right? Because God's going to protect me. My life should just be happy all the time. And so many Christians, when they face a major challenge, they become shaken in their faith. It's like, how can my marriage be in trouble? And yet I love God and I serve him faithfully. How can I lose my job and yet I, I've been tithing regularly? How can my loved one fall sick and die and yet I've been attending 4.30 a.m. prayers? Like how could God allow that? How can I get a miscarriage? How can I have an accident and yet I'm serving in church? And many times we get shocked at the existence of personal evil. We get shocked at misfortune. And the reason is because we are ignorant of the fact that we have an enemy. We have an enemy. And he's a defeated enemy, yes, but he's still a dangerous enemy. C.S. Lewis, he wrote in another book, uh, Mere Christianity. And he said, this world is enemy-occupied territory. And Christianity is a story of how the rightful king has landed and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. C.S. Lewis understood that this world is not, it's, it's not this la, 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 lovey-dovey place that we think it is. It is an occupied war zone. And Paul wants us to know that whether we like it or not, we are in a state of war. Tell your neighbor, you're in a state of war. Yeah. Yeah, so don't be surprised when things go thick. Don't be, don't be shocked because we're in a state of war. And that's why Paul wrote, writes, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now we're going to be talking about the armor of God uh, through this month. But Paul is saying that the devil has schemes that he uses against us. He has plans that he uses against us. And it's our responsibility to take our stand against them. The apostle uh, James, in James 4, 7, he wrote these words. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We have a responsibility and our responsibility is to resist the enemy. And Paul moves on to give us another very important principle. Uh, after having taught us that we have an enemy, he, he, keeps, he goes on to teach us another very important principle that we must understand. In verse 12, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, the word translated struggle is a Greek word that is, it, 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 the word is pale. And what it means is, you, you can imagine the picture of two wrestlers. Uh, swaying back and forth. Imagine two individuals that are locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, each trying different maneuvers to pin the other one and to make them submit. And Paul says that we're in a struggle. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, so important to understand, human beings, people are never our enemy. Humans are never the enemy. The enemy is a spiritual enemy and he is an expert at guerrilla warfare. And so it's so easy not to recognize his methods or his schemes. And here's how he works, you know. He will use people against you whenever you give him an opportunity. So for example, maybe you're married. What the enemy will do, he'll hide behind your spouse and then punch you in the nose. So you look up and who do you see? You see your spouse. And what do you do in ignorance? You punch right back. <laughs> Whether it was a cutting word whether it was a dismissive gesture, whether it was an uncaring thought, whether you, whether you just cut them down and you hit them where it hurts. You want your spouse to feel the same feeling you felt when they did it to you. And so you hit back with your words or you hit back with your attitude, not knowing that the real enemy is not your spouse, but the real enemy is actually cheering on as you look down on your spouse. And now you've entered into a competition on who can hurt the other the most. And guess who wins? None of you. It's always the enemy. And let me say this, people, it's not just true in marriage, but it's true in every sphere of life. It's not flesh and blood that we fight against. It's unseen spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Now, being aware of these things is essential to us if we want to win the war against them. Your wife, your husband is not your enemy. 
Your, your parent is not your enemy. Your brother, your sister is not never your enemy. Your discipleship group member is never your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. That person who hurt you, who broke your heart, that's not the enemy. Yes, they may have been in foolishness used by the enemy and allowed themselves in their foolishness to be used in that way. Yes, they may have issues and they're broken people. But guess what? Just like you, they were victims of the enemy, not the real enemy. And we need to start understanding the opposition for who it really is. The real battle is with the enemy of our souls. When you don't know this, guess what? You're going to keep falling for the enemy's schemes every single time. And that's why in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, the devil is a master of deceit. He says, when he lies, he speaks his native language for he's a liar and the father of lies. We need to, be, to start learning to see through those lies. And I believe that God wants us today to learn this thing. It's so important that we must pray for people, resist the enemy. Pray for people, resist the enemy. Why? Because people are not your problem. Come on, somebody. People are not your problem. The enemy is your problem. And the enemy is organized to wage war against you. You need to understand, it's not just a simple war. Uh, Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, Hollywood has given us this little picture of a, dev, of a, of a harmless red guy with a pointed tail and a pitchfork. You know, it completely distracts us from the real picture of the enemy that the scriptures draw for us. Pa Paul paints a very different picture. He paints a military picture. A picture of a spiritual army that is set up against God and his people. And Paul talks about at least four categories, four categories of this evil hierarchy. The first he talks about, he says uh, that our struggle is against the rulers. You know, the Greek word here, rulers, is ake, which is principalities or chief rulers. This talks about Satan's high command. These are the, the evil beings, the highest rank in Satan's kingdom who probably report directly to him. And now there's a great example in the book of Daniel, which is a possible example of this, where if you remember in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel prays and he fasts for 21 days without receiving an answer. He's praying for his people, but there's no answer. And then in Daniel chapter 12, uh, chapter 10, verse 12 to 14, an angel appears to Daniel and he says these amazing words. He says, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me. Have you noticed that? The prince of the Persian kingdom, this is not a human being he's talking about because it's an angel talking. And he says, resisted me 21 days. And then he says, then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, another angel, because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. You know, there's an evil spiritual ruler called the prince of the Persian kingdom. Uh, he says the king of Persia, but he's not talking about the actual king. He's talking about a power behind that king. And this, this spiritual ruler delayed the angel who had been sent by God to answer Daniel's prayer. And Daniel prayed and kept praying. And what happened is it took the archangel Michael, who is also called one of the chief princes, uh, taking on the demon. So the archangel Michael had to take on. He tackled that demon as he left. The, and that is what enabled the angel to get through to Daniel with the message he was praying for. Are you seeing the picture here? Uh, and the interesting thing is it's possible that every nation has an evil prince like the one that is mentioned. Uh, because this one was a prince of the Persian nation, the Persian kingdom. And this, this, this uh, power would be the one particular re responsible for the particular strongholds that are present in that nation. Because you know something? Every nation has its particular strongholds. Now, by God's grace, we can stand against these schemes. As powerful as they are, the Apostle John wrote to us in 1 John 4, 4, he said, You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them, because the one in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Somebody say amen. You know what? It's not about me. The one I represent is greater than the one who's in the world. And that's, that's, that's the first level. So we're talking about the rulers. But the second level of evil being is the authorities. The word used here is exousia, which means authority. And this one could suggest the generals who receive their orders from Satan's high command. And they're in charge of strategy for the demonic troops. Now, perhaps an authority would be a spirit that holds sway over a city. 
uh, in which case you, you, you'd see cities that have collective bondages or collective strongholds. For example, we think of Los Angeles and we specifically think of Hollywood, which has been used to bring thousands, millions of people globally into the slavery of lust and pornography. But look closer home and you find that even in our own cities, cities like Nairobi have a reputation. We used to be called Nairobi. I don't know if they still use that term. But it, it's like a, a city known for greed and for don't care. It's like get ahead at your whatever you need to do to get ahead. Or you he, hear about cities like Nakuru, nowadays known as Nax Vegas. Why? Because of its revelry, like anything goes. Or nowadays Naivasha, Vashas, is getting quite a reputation as well for, for debauchery. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because every church, and this is a thing I really believe, the church should, re should research the strongholds in the area it finds itself in. Because that's the way you begin to understand how to seek God's wisdom and guidance to resist becoming victims of that stronghold. I mean, if you, you're going to find that as you pray, God begins to show you certain things. And one of the things you do is through, not just through prayer, but doing acts that are opposite of that stronghold. For example, if a stronghold in your area is a stronghold of lust and immorality, then you can actually begin to say, how do we as a church, how do we as Christians in this area, take care to guard our purity? Let's not live in ignorance. Let's begin to understand that that's the area that's under attack in this region and begin to live lives that honor God. And so that's the first. You, you've seen that there are powers and then there are authorities. The third level he talks about is the powers of this dark world. And that, that phrase, uh, it, it actually, the Greek word means the holders of this world. The holders of this world. And the picture is of evil spirits that hold the physical world in a grip of darkness. Now, these could be spirits that Satan has given charge of a false beliefs, uh, false belief systems that tie up people's minds and keep them from God. Uh, whether it's alternative religions, Islam, Buddhism, communism, secular humanism, whatever it is, whatever thought process or worldview that keeps people away from God, whether it's secular colleges that teach anti-Christian views, and many of you have been in schools like those, whether it's entire industries that trap young people in darkness, gambling, uh, addiction to, to pornography, gaming, movies, just to mention a few. These are, these are powers that are, uh, exist in our world today. Today, witchcraft has even rebranded itself. I don't know if you've noticed. You're going to find things online like Ouija boards, astral projection. People talk about cleansing your house of negative energy. All these are just really new age practices that have found their way in and now have become commonplace. Uh, you're going to find these practices in medicine, in psychology, in fitness, in team building at work. And you, you're going to hear Christians talk about them very casually. Things like yoga or practicing mindfulness or manifesting your dreams. Have you heard people say, I'm manifesting that thing? I even hear people say that in prayer meetings. I'm manifest. What are you manifesting? That is not, that's not what the scripture teaches. You see, we're, 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 we're just caught up in these powers that are changing how we think. Movies today, whether it's Marvel, from Marvel to Disney, you're going to find that they are full of openly demonic references. And Hollywood celebrities openly flaunt their occultic involvement. All this is warfare, my friends. And it's calculated to desensitize people from the risks that exist and to keep them away from God. It's not harmless entertainment. Uh, when you allow your children to watch some of those cartoons, it's not harmless entertainment. This is actually powers that hold this world and they want to hold our children as well. The fourth level of evil beings is the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now this fourth one is probably the demonic foot soldiers, the ones who are the lower rank ones, the ones that oppose and obstruct men and women from finding our God and living out his purpose in the world. And they target non-Christians to keep them from knowing God. Uh, but they also hinder the spiritual growth of God's people after they commit to Christ. And that's why some people are so resistant, by the way, to the things of God. Maybe you've been trying to bring them to church. You're trying to get them to join a discipleship group. You're trying to get them to do things that will get them closer to God. But there's just a resistance. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He said, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So that's, that, those are powers. Those are those, are the, those little authorities. And, and here's something I want you to understand. As we talk about these hierarchies that Paul is teaching, these hierarchies of de demonic forces, this is not actually a major emphasis of Scripture. In fact, this is one of the few texts that actually goes into that level of detail. We don't have entire chapters written about the devil. And I believe there's a reason for that. 
But God wants us to be aware of the enemy, but not to focus on the enemy. God doesn't want us focusing on the enemy. I remember somebody once teaching us that if, 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 if you're a, a government agent working in the treasury and they wanted to teach you how to, to, to spot fake notes, they might show you a few examples of fake notes just so that you understand how they work. But the majority of your training will be spent in studying real notes, studying real currency. Why? So that you can, you can see it and you can know it when you spot it. And it's the same thing. I don't believe that spending inordinate amount of time studying demonology, studying the enemy, that's not what God wants us to do. I believe we need to know enough to understand His schemes. But once we do, we must focus on getting closer to God, on living in such a way that honors Him, so that we can spot when something is of God and when something is not. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 32 to His disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's a truth that sets you free, not studying the lie, it's studying the truth. And the key from today is that we are at war. The key truth I want us to understand today is that we are at war against an organized spiritual army. And that enemy is not human. That army is not human. And that's why we must pray for people, resist the enemy. Say it with me. Pray for people, resist the enemy. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at some very practical ways to resist the enemy and to ensure we have a resilient faith. And, and then on May 18th, I want to just begin to mention this early. Uh, during our gathering, because uh, we're going to have our gathering uh, on the 17th and 18th, uh, we're going to take some time to pray over the spiritual attacks we may be facing in our families and elsewhere. And I believe there's going to be some amazing victory we're going to experience uh, as we do this. Now, I want to just uh, encourage you even today, just sign up to attend. There's a link there. Uh, and I'd love for you to come and attend it live at our Hill City headquarters. Uh, if you can't, we'll also have a streaming link, but we'd love as many of you to be there personally. Uh, but as I conclude today, I really believe that God is reminding us today, pray for people, resist the enemy. And I want to end today by praying for two groups of people. There are some people here uh, who, whose faith has been weakened by challenges. Uh, you, you went through difficult times and instead of being strong in the Lord and, and taking your stand, what has happened is that you were surprised and you were discouraged when you experienced those challenges. And maybe you even gave up on God. Maybe your faith became weak. Maybe you became those Christians who I'm like, I'll come to church, I'm going to watch from a distance, but I don't want to get involved in case I get hurt again. And I want to encourage you. I believe that God's word to you is today is to say, remember you are in a battle. And you're doing what you're doing right now is actually succumbing to the enemy. And today is a day that God wants you to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And then there's somebody else here who's been fighting people. You've, you've been fighting your spouse. You've been fighting your, your boss. You've been fighting your family. Instead of fighting the real enemy. And today God has convicted you that it's time for you to stop fighting people and start praying for people. It's time for you to start praying for their deliverance, to see them as victims, not to see them as enemies. May God open your eyes to understand who the real enemy is. Let me just pray for us as we conclude. Father, thank you that even as we've learned today, that Father, we are to pray for people and to resist the enemy. And I want to pray for that believer here who's been discouraged. I pray right now that through this message, the Lord is strengthening you. Ah, praise be to the Lord who strengthens your arm for war and your fingers for battle. Ah, this, I pray for you that this message would lift you up and strengthen you again, that you'll be able to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power and that you will not give up. In fact, you will stand up and resist the enemy and he will flee from you. I also want to pray for that person who has been in this place and maybe you've been fighting your spouse. Maybe you've been fighting other people. You've been in this place where you're so depressed, so angry because of people. And I pray today that the Lord would open the eyes of your heart, that you would begin to see who the enemy really is and that God would give you an empathy for people, a love for people, that you would see them not as the enemy, but as victims of the enemy. And the encouragement to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And so Father, I pray that this month would be an amazing month for every one of us. Open our eyes, help us to see and understand. Help us to stand strong in You. And I pray that Lord, we will have an unshakable faith as we begin to understand this call to battle. And so I bless you God's people in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.